My name is Elizabeth Presser. I'm head of the Centre for Ideas at the Victorian College of the Arts and Music, and I've been a sculptor um, for many, many years, more than I'd care to remember. I taught for many years in the sculpture department at um, the Victoria College in the Peran Sculpture Department, and then in, I think, 1991, I moved to the Victorian College of the Arts Sculpture Department, where I taught until 2002, uh, or 2003, when I took up the position of head of the Centre for Ideas. So, initially, for uh, this Key Thinkers series, I had proposed a lecture on the contemporary French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, as he, together with his, with his close friends, Maurice Blanchot and Jacques Derrida, had shaped much of my thinking about art. However, um, when I was initially thinking of uh, talking about um, Jean-Luc Nancy, on further reflection, I thought it would be useful to speak about how and why I have even come to take an interest in these particular writers whose writing is so shaped by a type of corporeal or sensory thinking. This thinking shows itself in the elaborate use of metaphor, which is never just an embellishment or decoration, but has folded within it the most decisive moments of philosophical speculation. It is a type of philosophy steeped in the physical world, and it is the physical world that is quite literally the medium of sculpture. So to speak about how, as a sculptor, I approach the writing of these philosophers requires a further step back to how thinking for an artist involves not only discursive and analytical thinking, but an intimate, sensory and intuitive thinking. And in my case, years before even hearing the names of Maurice Blanchot, Jacques Derrida and Jean-Luc Nancy, in fact from the time I first started learning to make sculpture at the age of 17 at the Victorian College of the Arts in the sculpture department which was then located uh, behind the National Gallery of Victoria. Until that time, so my thinking has been shaped by the work of Auguste Rodin. So a focus of this talk is on how thinking can be a form of making and how I first learnt this from Rodin, from looking at this book on his work and from looking at his work in the National Gallery of Victoria. This, this is the book, in fact, that I just got out of the library, which was the very book that I used to um, have out constantly on loan in the mid-1970s. Um, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And when I was a student, um, I spent so much of my time just looking at the pictures. I don't think I read much about it, and it was really through the work of... Uh, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke that I learnt about Rodin, but this book was very much um, the love of my life when I was 17 years of age. As I, I'm presenting this lecture, I'm talking about thinking as a sort of making, thinking that makes use not only of the five senses, sight, taste, touch, smell and hearing, but of one's proprioceptive and kinesthetic sensations, of breathing, of emotion and of language. This is the thinking that art requires. So here I want to start with an image from the funeral of Rodin. It's from the 17th of November, 1917. The mourners are carrying a plaster cast of Rodin's most famous work, The Thinker. This is the sculpture that will mark his graveside where he's buried at his studio in Medon, just outside of Paris. Rodin said this about the sculpture. He said, the thinker has a story. In the days long gone by, I, I conceived the idea of the gates of hell. Before the door, seated on the rock, would be Dante, thinking of the plan of the poem. Behind him, all the characters from the Divine Comedy. This project was not realized. Thin, aesthetic Dante, in his straight robe, separated from all the rest of the world, would have been without meaning. Guided by my first inspiration, I conceived another thinker, a naked man, seated on a rock, his, first, his fist against his teeth, he dreams. The fertile thought slowly elaborates itself within his mind. 
He is no longer a dreamer, he is a creator. And it is precisely this connection between thinking and creation, or thinking and making, that I am concerned with. As a sculptor and as a teacher of sculpture, I have worked for many years, either directly or indirectly, with the human body. I have always been fascinated by the forensic and poetic qualities with which Rodin used sculpture to record unexpected combinations of anatomical parts, using his capacity to invent for himself a sort of language. Much of my understanding of Rodin's work is mediated through the writing, as I said, of the great German poet Rainer Maria Rilke, who as a young man spent three months in 1903 working as Rodin's private secretary. Rilke's monograph on Rodin, in fact, has been very much like a secret Bible. And this is a, um, a quote that um, the, the wonderful English writer on, sculpt, on sculpture, William Tucker, used, in fact, in his little introduction to Rilke's book. And it's interesting that Tucker used that term, a secret Bible, because that's what Rilke's writing on Rodin has become for me. And surprisingly, um, as you move around the world, you find that there are so many other sculptors that will say something very, very similar about what Rilke's writing has meant to them. Today, uh, perhaps one would not characterise Rodin's work as being particularly innovative, but Rilke's analysis and identification of unique elements in Rodin's work defined him, define him as a sculptor of singular originality. I'm just showing um, a, few in, a few images of Rodin's studio work. And there's Rodin uh, with his lifelong companion, Rose, and the young Rainer Maria Rilke at, uh, at Rodin's home in Medon. It's a beautiful portrait of Rose. Rodin was born in 1840 into a working class family in Paris, the second child of the family. Uh, his father was a, a police department clerk. Rodin was largely self-educated and began drawing at the age of 10. Between the ages of 14 and 17, Rodin attended the Petite Ecole, a school specialising in art and mathematics, where he studied drawing and painting. Rodin submitted a clay model of a companion to the Grande Ecole in 1857 in an attempt to win entrance. He did not succeed and two further applications were also denied. Given that entrance requirements at the Grand Ecole were not particularly high, um, the rejection uh, was considerable for Rodin. He really suffered from this. Leaving the Petite Ecole in 1857, Rodin would earn a living as a craftsman and ornamenter for the next two decades, producing decorative objects and architectural embellishments. So it's interesting to note at this time that Perhaps at no other time in history, certainly in France, had there um, been such disparity between art forms. Um, you, you simply don't find uh, the physical natures of painting and sculpture so separate in terms of opportunities as you could find in 19th century France. Rodin was born in the same year as Monet and Renoir. Cezanne was born the year before, Degas was born in 1834, Monet was born in 1832, and Pizarro in 1830. By the time Rodin's first major sculpture was completed and accepted by the Salon for exhibition in 1877, the Impressionists were already holding their third exhibition and had already established the radical principles of their art. But by comparison to the simplicity and economy with which modernist painting emerged, Sculpture was weighed down by a system of state patronage, public taste, and a civic and moral role. French painting, in contrast, had always had a radical tradition from the time of David's neoclassicism, which had been adopted by the art of the revolution, onwards. Delacroix, Corot, Corbet, and the Barbesson school had all prepared the way for painting. All the debates that had pulled painting apart, debates between Ang and Delacroix about line and colour, the realism of Courbet 
and the rise of landscape painting had left sculpture untouched. Much of what seems overly rhetorical and gestural in Rodin's sculpture comes about from him trying to work through themes and traditions long exhausted in painting. William Tucker says that Rodin had to be Jericho, Delacroix and Courbet simultaneously with Manet and Cezanne. So whatever hardship the painters at this time faced, um, they at least possessed a sense of camaraderie, a new attitude to exploring light and colour and representation that was simply not there in sculpture. And they were able to realise paintings of remarkable ambition and variety in a way that sculpture simply could never do. It was not in the nature of sculpture as an art to achieve the immediacy and directness of realisation of, that had happened in painting. That sort of immediacy can only be achieved in sculpture through enormous physical effort and organisation that could really only be funded by substantial commissions. Sculpture is enormously expensive to produce. It's still enormously expensive to have anything cast in bronze today, as um, some of you would well know. And the public commissioning system operating in France would have been unlikely to accept anything that looked vaguely radical. In fact, Michelangelo, it's probably true to say, was the last great sculptor whose personal vision was in direct relation to his handling of his material. Michelangelo, as you would well know, carved directly in marble and he had complete control over the image as it was emerging. Um, and it's not as though there weren't artists who were experimenting with sculpture uh, up to the time of Rodin. Certainly, Daumier and Degas um, had experimented uh, and were continuing to experiment with sculpture, but they simply uh, didn't have the sort of ambition that Rodin possessed as a sculptor. He was the one that wanted to do the major commissions. So he had no choice but to go through the commissioning system. Even after he had won the commissions for the Gates of Hell and the state had pur purchased a number of his works, um, he still chose to work with somewhat conventional themes that belonged to uh, 19th century sculpture. And works uh, like, this is uh, The Walking Man, works like this, and behind it you see the large head of Iris, which is sitting on a pedestal. Works like this and various of his fragmented figures um, really had no place in the public sphere during his lifetime. Rather, they were byproducts of the large commissions, and their home was in the studio where um, often a more informed audience could see the work. In the studio, uh, the conditions really favoured the fragments, the works in progress, the works whose status as sculpture um, Rodin was very often unsure of. In 19th century France, sculpture had become an art in which the taste and ambition of the public patron had become the determining factor. The academic sculpture of this century was characterised by its virtuosity of technique and often overly rhetorical and declamatory gestures and subject matter. Um, these things were often in complete dis disproportion to any formal invention or sensibility. Sculpture had basically become an industry commercialised and mechanised to a remarkable degree. The artist gave over his clay, uh, his clay sculpture or his uh, plaster sculpture to the craftsmen, to the stonemasons, who would then um, either cast the work into bronze or carve it into, um, into marble. So the stonemasons were, had the most incredibly um, advanced techniques in carving, absolutely superb, so that any sort of surface detail could be rendered with absolute verisimilitude. They could represent lace and um, all sorts of texture, hair, um, all sorts of fabrics to the most extraordinary degree. But this was always at an in inverse proportion to the sort of um, imaginative content, if you like, of the work. So sculptors had very often no hand in the final translation of the work. It was a situation um, very similar to perhaps how a film director would work today. Here you can see, um, again, just this extraordinary example of this exquisite use of materials, but um, in a way that perhaps 
to our sensibility, certainly um, from the 20th century onwards, we would tend to think of this work as statues perhaps rather than sculpture. That's um, Napoleon. <laughs> Again, extraordinary detail in the work. But th this is um, Michelangelo's dying slave. And interestingly, this is the work that Rodin chose to, to base his first major work on. His first major work was the Age of Bronze. And this is the model that he used. Again, the pose is taken from Michelangelo. Um, so this is the work done in... 1877. Rodin was simultaneously, um, with this work, accused of making a sketch rather than a finished sculpture and of casting from life, and the work uh, indeed was rejected by the Salon. It's interesting how he deliberately chose to reject the whole history of sculpture going right back to Michelangelo as, as his starting point. Um, and I think Perhaps what could be said is that the great achievement of Rodin in challenging the 19th century academic sculpture is perhaps, perhaps best characterised um, at first by the idea that sculpture, uh, that the sculptor basically takes responsibility for every aspect of their work. Its conception, that is the choice of subject matter, um, its size, its material, its relationship to the viewer and its finish, that the sculptor, um, Rodin, sing signal has to take complete responsibility for those things. Also, secondly, the other um, great achievement of Rodin um, and what sort of observing his sculpture um, will reveal is that the sculpture itself is completely identified with the structure of the human body. In other words, the figure that he works with is the sculpture. The sculpture is the figure. And ultimately, um, this comes back to the use of materials and his studio techniques. Modelling and casting become his language with its own lexicon and its own grammar. This handling of the materials, clay and, pl and plaster, as materials felt and shaped for themselves, begin to release sculpture from its subject matter. It's interesting because even though throughout his life Rodin uh, professed an unabiding commitment to nature and to the observation and representation of the human body, um, it sort of paradoxically results in a sort of abstraction of the human body. Rodin handled clay unlike any other sculptor before him, um, and clay is the most mundane, inert, undefined and aesthetically mute material. It is a stark and primal challenge to work a lump of clay with, with one's bare hands. Um, it is what people did basically 40,000 years ago. It's our first sculpture. Yet clay uh, possesses an immediacy and pliability and will make manifest every gesture, movement and mark. It is these qualities that Rodin focuses on. Clay was treated as a medium in its own right. It was pushed, squeezed, hacked and gouged. The impression of wet cloth was left on it. Dabs of clay were left where they fell all to the point where the intelligible, often the intelligible communication of form would completely break down um, if it wasn't for, for the human body as subject matter. And it's really that we tend to read in certainly the more abstract works of Rodin, it's through identification of our own understanding of our bodies that we interpret his work. On the work of the crouching figure, for example, you can see something of how Rodin... Um, reconstructed the human body, how he played with human anatomy. Because what you have is a sculpture which is like, um, which is really structured, the corners of it, if you like, are structured by the shoulders. Um, the shape of the elbow holds the sculpture in. Every part of the sculpture is absolutely considered. There is nothing that is arbitrary or left really unconsidered in this work. And what's also so wonderful about Rodin's work, just to go back, for example, to that beautiful portrait of Rose, um, you'll see moments where 
just that, that little moment with the walking man, look how he simply gouged the back of that. I mean, it's extraordinary the way he used clay. And often when you're looking at his bronze sculpture, you'll see um, where he's simply taken a knife and hacked into the surface of the form. It's as though he's really trying to reaffirm constantly um, the materiality of the work, the materiality and the reality that this is um, made from clay, this dumb, inert material. And here with this beautiful portrait of um, his, his companion Rose, you see how he's left the lines of the, the casting. Um, he doesn't, very often in his sculpture, there was no attempt to erase uh, the marks at all. In other words, it's simply a way of drawing attention to the fact that this is a work of making, that the hand has made this, and this is the process, that cast, um, plaster casting is the process that has brought this object into existence, this thing into existence. And there are moments, again, in the sculpture where you look, for example, um, at her eyebrow, where it's just little lumps of clay, little um, daubs of clay that have simply just landed there. And any little incidental mark has been kept in the work as well and actually cast into the, this sculpture. A work like this, which is done so simply, um, which again was part of the Gates of Hell, but for Rodin, he kept in his studio um, literally thousands and thousands of uh, his little plaster sculptures, which he'd pull apart and recombine. And it's that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But I'll just quickly go through a few more of his sculptures before I, I sort of move into a more personal account of uh, my, my response to Rodin. This beautiful little uh, sculpture of the dancer Nijinsky, and just behind that, um, the head of a wonderful Japanese dancer. These were done at about the same time in 1910. But you can see this extraordinary little work that really is just... Um, felt it's a little piece of clay that he literally squeezed together in his fingers and everything about that is the result of Rodin's hand touching the clay. So that's how the anatomy of this beautiful little sculpture is formed. Uh, the very famous work, The Burgers of Calais, uh, again um, another major commission for Rodin but unlike his predecessors he chose to work um, in a, in a very democratic fashion by having the burghers simply placed along the ground. Um, many of his predecessors would have, for example, piled the figures on top of each other or had them up on a plinth. Rodin argued that he wanted these figures on the ground. In fact, they were meant to be placed up so that the citizens of Calais um, could actually walk amongst them. The story itself is, is um, very touching. It's the story of how um, in, the, in the Middle Ages, the, uh, Edward III, the King of England, actually held um, siege, uh, held the, the city of Calais under siege. And the population of the city was starving. They were told by the King of France that they simply could not surrender to the English. And um, after many, many months of starvation, uh, the English king took pity on them and, and asked them um, to give up their six most honoured citizens. And what you have before you here, what Rodin has so um, beautifully represented, are the six most important people um, in the city of Calais coming forward to offer their lives to the English king. They believe that they're going to be executed and so they walk um, forward as instructed with ropes around their necks. This is uh, the head of the um, writer Balzac and this was another very important commission that Rodin struggled with and suffered for as well. And uh, again here you can see in the clay head um, the moments probably uh, just on the cheek where the, um, the wet cloth that's, uh, because clay dries out so readily, uh, sculptors have to keep their clay dry by putting um, wet hessian or some sort of material over it to hold the moisture in. And here you can see an example where Rodin, instead of removing the impression of the cloth, has simply left it there, allowing this um, to, be, to become part of the head. Anyway, after many versions of um, modelling different forms for the 
this very important commission, Rodin uh, came up with this um, extraordinarily beautiful sculpture. And here you have uh, these wonderful photos of the photographer Edward Steichen, um, who photographed the work at midnight. Rodin had the work taken out of his studio at Madon and had it um, put on a plinth so that Steichen could photograph it. And there's a series of exquisite photographs taken of, of this work at, at midnight. And it goes from towards midnight through to about 4 a.m., and if not later. There's um, absolutely exquisite works. And this is the thing that I think, as a sculptor, um, so many sculptors, sculptors will work with photography because very often um, it's the, the photographic image that will give you a sense of how you want the work to be perceived. Whereas painters are always in control of the image that's emerging, they're always in control of the light, how the forms in there um, on the canvas, if you like, are represented. Sculptors will always struggle with how their work is going to be seen. They struggle with how um, the light touches it and how people come to it. And Rodin's way of controlling that um, was really quite extraordinary. He had a series of really eminent photographers photograph his work. And then these were presented as postcards to um, a much wider audience. Just going back briefly to the Gates of Hell, these were the works, uh, the works that came out of it that um, commission that was, I think, um, won in 1880. And the gates of hell, Dante's Inferno, occupied Rodin for the rest of his life until he died in 1917. And it wasn't for many years afterwards, I think 1937, that the gates were finally cast into bronze. So everything we know about the gates um, are based very much on the, on the plaster sculptures that uh, were the models that Rodin worked with. There is um, a matter-of-factness and a particularity in his working methods that certainly set him apart from other sculptors. This workmanlike attitude was clearly expressed in his, in his advice to the young poet Rilke. And there's Rilke standing um, at the doorway of one of Rodin's studios. He said to Rilke, why don't you just go and look for something, look at something, for example, an animal at the Jardin de Plantes, and keep on looking at it till you're able to make a poem of it. This is the thing that um, Rilke, as a very young man, was struggling to find his voice in poetry, if you like, and this is how he learnt so much from the work of Rodin. Um, from just watching his everyday workmanlike attitudes. And Rodin's advice, um, Rodin would never stand on ceremony. He simply said to Rilke, go and look and make something. Look at something till you make something. You make a poem. So I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about Rodin's studio techniques, um, particularly the use of plaster, but how... Rilke comes to write about this and how his writing uh, shapes so much of what I find um, of exemplary value in Rodin's processes. So I want to start with the idea of plaster. And plaster is a medium which I've worked with um, probably for the last 30 years. I don't know how long. I can't quite do the maths there, but it's a very, very long time. And um, it's it's probably the most, one of the most humble, next to clay, it's one of the most humble materials. And certainly when I was a student, plaster was very much um, a sort of, um, in, a, in a way, a sort of very poor, almost despised material. It was a transitional material meant to preserve um, what was modelled in clay in an intermediate state before it was cast into bronze. So... Its main component, of course, is gypsum, which is quarried, then baked in a kiln and pulverised. Plaster is mixed as a powder with water, poured into moulds as a slurry and moulded with the hands as a paste before it warms, thickens and sets it's in its final state. Plaster, plaster remains soft enough to carve and to work with. Plaster possesses an extraordinary forensic property, um, it reproduces and imitates forms, surfaces and textures to, to quite an extraordinary degree. Life casts and death masks are used to preserve the image of the living and the dead. 
These casts replicate the features as well as the finest details of the face and body, including the pores, lines, scars and hair follicles of the skin. Plaster casts also serve the various stages of clay sculpture, as I said before, casting um, into bronze. So plaster is a medium of empathy and mimesis. But plaster also possesses the most poetic qualities in its delicacy and subtlety. When poured, it shrouds and veils forms in an opaque, liquid, in an opaque liquidity. It meets the dissonance between shapes, conceals imperfections, melds and elides surfaces and planes. It coats, clings and adheres. In intense light, plaster appears as an opaque and impenetrable surface, yet at certain liminal moments, such as at dawn and dusk, plaster glows as though illuminated from within. At these times, the articulation of surface detail and shadow subsides, giving way to a faint and even whiteness. Plaster breathes, it becomes damp to the touch, absorbing and reabsorbing moisture in the atmosphere, yet becomes crisp, parched and brittle when the humidity drops. The lime in plaster purifies and bleaches, it distills sediment in liquid and draws out impurities and residues. The ancient Greeks made plaster so exquisite in quality that it was equivalent to an artificial marble. It could be polished. Vitruvius tells us that it would reflect the beholder's face as in a mirror, a fine trans and fine translucent sheets of polished plaster were used as windows in their temples. Water from the rivers, lakes and lagoons were mixed with the dry plaster to form these windows. And interestingly, amongst the early Greeks, plaster was used as a preservative. The early Christian writer, Firmicus Matthaeus, describes the use of plaster as a material of preservation in recounting the story of the death of Dionysus. Firmicus Maternus writes that as Jupiter was no longer able, Jupiter the god um, was no longer able to endure the torments of his anguished soul, he could find no way to console himself for the loss of his son. He had a statue made of the boy, modelled in plaster, and the sculptor then placed the heart of the boy in the part of the statue, which was shaped in the form of the breast. This is, um, in fact, a really beautiful story about the wife of um, Jupiter, Juno, who was very jealous of Jupiter's young son, Dionysus. And um, while Jupiter was away, uh, while Jupiter was away, Juno had uh, Dionysus killed by the Titans. The Titans were, were the giants. And in order to disguise their crime, um, she instructed the, instructed the Titans to pull the body of um, the young Dionysus apart and to eat it. And it was only his heart that was saved, and it was saved by, by Dionysus' sister. So when um, Jupiter returned from his journeys as uh, uh, Firmicus Maternus reports, um, he was so heartbroken, um, absolutely inconsolable that his son had been killed, that he took the heart of his son, that was the only um, part of the young boy that was left, and he had a sculptor make a plaster sculpture, he had a sculptor make a plaster sculpture of the young boy, and within that plaster sculpture he had the heart interned in the place where the heart should be. And um, it was as though somehow the portrait, this plaster portrait of the young boy, was going to preserve his life forever, it was going to hold him in this liminal state between um, life and death. And this is, this is the place, really, that, scul uh, that sculpture and that plaster sculpture occupies so beautifully. So plaster, its mythopoetic meaning, is that it is a preservative. Um, and as I said, it was even... Um, used actually to preserve fruit in ancient Greece. In ancient Greece it was um, sprinkled on grapes and other fruits to stop them rotting. So this idea of, of plaster as a preservative is something um, that really has been very important in my own practice and it's something that I really became acquainted with in looking at the work of Rodin.